YouTube, it's Zoe, and today we are going to talk about every single book that I read in 2018. We're going to cover my reading stats, every star rating I gave to every book, and then I'm going to review the books that I didn't review during my only other wrap-up of the entire year. I was really on top of my book reviews. So this is going to be quite a long video. I hope you can get comfortable, grab something to drink, and I also will include timestamps down below in the description if you want to skip to a particular part of this video in case you don't want to watch the whole thing, which I totally get. Anyway, let's get started. Now, I only read 35 books in 2018, not including the 20 books that I read for school, but I don't want to talk about those because I've graduated. It's in the past. Don't look back. So I only read 35 books for fun. But I did reread a book. I read a book twice this year, so I only read 34 individual books for pleasure in 2018. Not my best reading year, but I'm okay with it. It's better than reading nothing. Also, things were happening this year, so I'm calling it a win, even though I didn't win my Goodreads reading challenge. Side note, at the beginning of the year, I usually set my Goodreads reading goal to be kind of an aspirational goal, something that I would love to hit in an ideal setting, but I never really hit that goal. So at the end of the year, I lower my goal to match the actual amount of books I read that year just to make myself feel better. But at the end of 2018, I forgot to lower my reading goal, so it says that I failed. It actually hid my reading challenge from me, so I can't immediately see that I failed. And now on the reading challenge it says, better luck next year, which is so sassy. I'm in a one-sided feud with Goodreads. <laughs> I'm so upset. Anyway, <laughs> my low number will make these statistics easier to calculate, so that's a good thing. Out of the 34 books that I'm looking at, my average star rating was exactly four stars, which is higher than I was expecting, but I need to keep in mind that I DNF books all the time. The moment I'm not feeling a book, I will put it down and never pick it up again, usually because I've forgotten that I actually read it in the first place. Whether I'm 50 pages into the book or 50 pages from the end, I'll just stop reading it. So usually the books that I review are ones that I finished and enjoyed. Also, I tend to have pretty good luck with my books because I am recommended books from people who know my reading tastes and know what I will enjoy, or I find recommendations through reviewers or booktubers whose opinions I trust. Also, also, let's be honest, I haven't been that critical with my book reviews in the past. Every book that I like, I give five stars. Every book that I end up hating, I give three stars. So, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I haven't been that critical. I think I've been afraid in the past to be critical with my book reviews because I know someone out there will enjoy the book and I don't want to deter people from reading certain things. I think my purpose here is to review books, so why am I not being critical? That's something that I plan on fixing. I don't know why I went off on this tangent, but moving on to the next statistic, what was my average page count? These books total 12,871 pages with an average page count of 368. My shortest book was We Should All Be Feminist by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, which is only 52 very small pages because it's based off of a TED talk. And my longest book was Lord of Shadows by Cassandra Clare, which was 699 pages. And this was actually the book that I read twice this year. As for genres, I read 17 books, exactly 50% that I'd consider to be realistic fiction, which I am including YA contemporary, romance, historical fiction, mystery, everything that's more or less realistic. 13 of my books, or 38%, were sci-fi, fantasy, paranormal. I'm making some very broad genres here. I read four nonfiction books, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's 12% of my reading. And then I read four graphic novels, two of which were graphic memoirs, which I included with nonfiction. Now let's break them down by age category. I read two books, 6% of my reading, that were middle grade or children's books. A whopping 62% of my reading, 21 of my books were young adult, and then 11 of my books, 
32% were adult. In 2019, I hope to read closer to 50-50 YA and adult and 50-50 realistic fiction and fantasy, sci-fi, paranormal, all of those things. In general, I hope to read more widely. Now we're going to talk about all the books I read. I will include timestamps to every book that I'm going to talk about if you want to hear me talk about certain books. And I will also include a link to the only other wrap up I did in 2018 if you want to hear me talk more in depth about the first couple of books. The first book I read in 2018 was I Believe in a Thing Called Love by Maureen Gu, which I gave 3.5 out of 5 stars. I thought it was an extremely cute but extremely predictable YA contemporary inspired by K-dramas. I read a graphic memoir, Persepolis, The Story of a Childhood by Marjan Satrapi, which chronicles her life growing up in Iran during the Islamic Revolution, and I gave it four out of five stars. I read all four books of The Raven Cycle by Maggie Steve Otter during a 24-hour readathon, so I can't really distinguish where one ends and the other begins, but because I loved the overall story, I gave all of them five out of five stars. <laughs> I think my favorite is Blue Lily Lily Blue, but I am honestly not sure. I care about these characters so deeply. I am very much a character focused reader rather than plot focused, which is why I tend to stray towards contemporaries rather than fantasies. But this is a paranormal series that focuses so heavily on character development and relationship development and I loved it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm going to reread these in 2019 one, because I love them, but two, because I need to know what happens in each individual book. <laughs> I need to pick a favorite one of the series. Next, I read Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan, which I gave four out of five stars. The movie adaptation also came out in 2018. And truthfully, I kind of prefer the movie, which doesn't often happen. I have seen the movie three times already, and I just wanna keep on watching it until the end of my days. However, I still very much recommend the book because it is imbued with so much Chinese and Singaporean culture. There are footnotes with explanations and translations. I really felt like I was visiting this foreign country, which I have never been to before. It's a very different experience than watching the movie, but it feels kind of like a travel guide and also like Gossip Girl. I read The Wedding Date by Jasmine Guillory, which I also gave four out of five stars. This is a fluffy adult romance, which has a trope I love, fake dating that leads to real love. I also read Furthermore by Tahada Mafi, which is a middle grade fantasy novel, and I gave it four out of five stars when I first read it, but upon further reflection, I think I'd give it more of a 3.5 to a 3 star rating. It was fun and whimsical to read in the moment, but it was a little bit too nonsensical and the world wasn't as fleshed out as I'd like. Also, it was ultimately pretty forgettable. I haven't thought about it since I read it back in March. Next, I read Lord of Shadows by Cassandra Clare for the first time in 2018. This is the second book in the Dark Artifices series, and I read it almost a year late because everybody was warning me about the ending, and I was scared. <laughs> the first time I read it, I gave it five out of five stars, but I'll talk about the second time I read it, later. Whoop. Ah, nuts. Now moving on to the books that I read from May onward and therefore have not reviewed in a wrap up yet. First up is Save the Date by Morgan Matson, which was her newest release and I was waiting years for it because they kept on moving the release date back and my expectations were getting higher and higher because I was waiting and Sadly, it did not deliver. This is a YA contemporary which follows Charlie, the youngest of five siblings. For the first time in years, all of her family members are going to be under one roof to celebrate her older sister's birthday. Birthday? Wedding! Her parents are also planning on selling their family home when Charlie heads off to college, so Charlie's childhood is essentially being ripped away from her and she's having trouble coping. Her mother also writes a famous comic strip and there are examples of the comic strip in the book. That's one thing I love about Morgan Matson's books. They're more than just prose, more than just writing the actual story. Like in Amy and Roger's Epic Detour, there were receipts as well as little journal pages. It's just a nice little addition 
It makes the book for me. Charlie tries desperately to make this wedding weekend perfect and everything. I mean, everything that can go wrong goes wrong. I gave it three out of five stars, which is the lowest rating I've given any Morgan Matson book. I really enjoyed some aspects of the book, such as Charlie's relationship with her family, the comic strips, and Morgan Matson's writing style. I really enjoy, but the plot was all over the place. Disaster after disaster kept on happening and my anxiety was going through the roof. It was no longer a cute rom-com with a few hijinks. This family <laughs> was straight up cursed. I can forgive contemporaries for being unbelievable at times if I am really into the characters and the romance, but that was not the case. Charlie was annoying and selfish, even though she was trying to do things for someone else. It was all ultimately to serve herself. And the romance? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> This one just wasn't for me. I then read Floored by seven UK authors, which I'm going to read off because seven authors, Sarah Bernard, Holly Bourne, Tanya Byrne, Non Pratt, Melinda Salisbury, Lisa Williamson, and Eleanor Wood. My new friend Emma from Drinking By Myself works for the publisher over in the UK, and she asked when I was there for the summer if I would read the book with her and film a video for their YouTube channel, Book Break. I did it. We filmed a video. We talked about online relationships and the book. It was a lot of fun. I will link it somewhere on the screen if you want to watch it. I gave it 3.5 out of 5 stars. It follows six British teens who all end up in an elevator in the same building when a man in the elevator dies right in front of them. They start up a group chat to kind of talk through what happened and they eventually become friends and decide to meet up on the same day every year. I think it's the anniversary that the man died which is gruesome. This takes place from the time that they are teens, trying on different personalities, figuring out what they want to do with their lives, to their early 20s, and it follows how their personalities, their goals, and their relationships have changed. Since there are six different perspectives and you only hear from them once a year, it's hard to fully grasp each character and really care for each character. Also, pretty sure that each author had their own character, and you could tell that none of them wanted their character to be the supporting cast. So all their storylines, a lot of things were happening and it was hard to keep them straight. It was a fun quick read, especially because I was reading it while living in London and it takes place in the UK, but it's pretty forgettable. I haven't thought about it since I read it back in May, but now we have a book that is not forgettable in the slightest. My favorite book of 2018. It is The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Yeah! Five out of five stars. Oh, I know you're probably sick of everybody talking about this, but it's really good. Please read it. This is written as if it was a memoir. It follows two perspectives, the first being Evelyn Hugo herself. She is a woman of Cuban descent who becomes an A-list Hollywood movie star during the golden age of Hollywood from the 1950s to the 1980s, but she is better known for the seven husbands she had during her lifetime. A big scandal. It also follows Monique, an unknown New York reporter, who is shocked and confused when Evelyn calls her up and asks, her to write her tell-all biography, which is going to make a lot of money. Half of it takes place during the present following Monique interviewing Evelyn, and half of it takes place during the past following Evelyn's rise to and fall from fame. I love learning and reading about filmmaking, and I love historical fiction, I love bi-representation, and I love drama. Put that all together, you get this wonderful book. <laughs> and on top of that, Evelyn Hugo is such a complex and compelling main character. She does morally questionable things, she is ruthless, ambitious, and she will do what she feels like she needs to do in order to get ahead, even if it means using and sabotaging other people. And as the older Evelyn is narrating this, you get to hear what older Evelyn thinks about past Evelyn's actions. You think that she would be denouncing some of the things that she did, but no, she completely takes ownership of everything that she did, clarifying that she did what she thought was right at the time. And it's so refreshing. I just, she's such a strong character and 
Even though I don't completely agree with her, she is so interesting to read about and I would gladly read five more books about Evelyn Hugo in different situations. I don't know, on Mars? Yeah, I'd read that. <laughs> she has strong beliefs, strong feelings, and a strong drive. She's not a kind or really a good person, but I still love her despite all her many, many flaws. <laughs> this is so addictive and I was so immersed while reading it, I completely forgot all of my surroundings. I cried multiple times in public. So I gave it five out of five stars. <sighs> we need a movie adaptation right now. If you haven't read it, please read it. I know I made your expectations very high, but I think it'll live up to the hype. Then I read Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman, which I gave four out of five stars. This is about Eleanor Oliphant, a 30 something year old woman who lives in Scotland and lives in relative isolation, sticking to a strict schedule. She has planned out everything that she does from the food she eats each night to the clothes she wears to work every single day. She's lonely and stuck to her routine, but when she falls in love with a stranger, she is inspired to completely break out of her routine and become the ordinary woman that she thinks that this man will fall for. The whole book chronicles her getting out of her comfort zone and dealing with mental health and trauma. Although romance is the catalyst for her changing, it is not the focus of this book, which I really enjoyed. I also enjoyed Eleanor's intelligence and dry wit. She wasn't immediately likable, but she definitely grows on you, and I cared so much about her well-being. Along with Eleanor Hugo and one character that I will mention later, they are the most memorable characters of the year. It took about 50 pages to really get into. It is not action-packed at all. It is pretty slow going, but once you get attached to the characters, especially Raymond and Eleanor herself, I couldn't put it down. It carefully balances light-hearted scenes with some much heavier topics in a very respectful manner, and because of that, and Eleanor herself, I very much recommend this. I reread the To All the Boys I Loved Before series by Jenny Han, which includes To All the Boys I've Loved Before, which I gave four stars, P.S. I Still Love You, which I gave three stars, and then Always and Forever Lara Jean, which I also gave four stars. I reread all of these because I actually wrote my final paper for my Asian American Studies class on, partially on, this series. I wrote about the role of food in Asian American coming of age stories and Lara Jean and her baking were an excellent example and I got a good grade on the paper so thank you Jenny Han. You probably already know what this series is about because there was a great Netflix adaptation but if you don't know what it's about, it follows Lara Jean, a teenage girl who writes love letters to all of her crushes as a way to end her crush on them. She uses them as a form of catharsis, so she releases all of her love onto this piece of paper. Sometimes they get a little creepy <laughs> and very specific, but she doesn't intend for anybody else to read them. But of course, one day, all of these letters were sent out to the respective crush. So they all know her deepest, darkest thoughts about them. My favorite of the three is definitely the last book, Always and Forever, Lara Jean, because she is more mature in this book. It's less about boys, although it is still kind of about boys, but she focuses more on herself, figuring out what she wants to do with her life, where she wants to go to university. She's really grown up, our little girl. The second book is the worst one, except for John Ambrose McLaren. He is 5,000% better than Peter Kaminsky. I'm just gonna put it out there. Please don't, please don't attack me, but it's true. My hope in life is that we get a fourth installment following Lara Jean as she's about to graduate from college after she's dumped Peter Kavinsky and all of that, but she's figuring out what she wants to do after college, freaking out, all the normal college graduate stuff, and then John Ambrose McLaren comes back. Or, I mean, an equally smart and respectful person that she falls in love with. I'm not picky, I just don't want Peter Kaminsky. Maybe she doesn't fall in love at all. Maybe it's just about her finding herself, her separating herself from romance. Okay, I'm moving on. I'm thinking too much about future books. Buckle in, my friends, because now it's time for my least favorite book of 2018, which was Leah on the Offbeat by Becky Albertalli. 
Oh my, I gave it two out of five stars, but I am, I might even make it lower than that. I really dislike this book for many reasons, so let's talk about it. I really enjoyed Simon vs. Homo Sapiens Agenda. I enjoyed his friend group and I enjoyed Becky Albertalli's writing style. So when I heard that we were getting a story centering on Leah, one of Simon's best friends, I was pretty darn excited. I pre-ordered this book. I was interested to see what her story would bring. No good things, in my opinion. <laughs> First of all, it read like bad fan fiction. I mean, the dedication of the book literally says, for the readers who knew something was up, even when I didn't. It's right there. So <laughs> this reads like it's entirely fan service. It seems like a few readers said to Becky Albertalli, hey, I think there could have been a certain romance in Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda. And Becky of Albertalli was like, sure. And even I was like, sure, when I first heard of this. But then, in this book, Becky Albertalli completely retcons what happens in Simon with Leah, making it seem like all of this came from somewhere. Not just started in this book, but had some history. But that wasn't how it was in that book. I'm really trying not to spoil anybody, but what? <laughs> they were hanging out the whole time in Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda? Really? We had no evidence. <laughs> what? The characters themselves felt very off, especially Nick and Abby. They were incredibly one-dimensional and they did not fit their personalities in the first book. They seemed like they were recreated in this book to specifically serve the interests of Leah in this scenario. The plot? Let me tell you about it. It was all over the place. Nothing happened really until the very end when everything was resolved extremely conveniently and all at once. In real life, the tension of the situation would not just end the way it did, but this is fan fiction. So um, I'm sorry. I'm mad. Leah was also a terrible character. Like I said earlier with Evelyn Hugo, I enjoy a terrible character when they are three-dimensional and when there is character development. Not the case. Leah was exactly the same at the beginning as she was at the end. She didn't learn any lessons from her bad behavior. She expected everybody else around her to learn from their mistakes and to never make mistakes in the first place unless they want her wrath. But she did not do the same for others. She uses people. She doesn't care about their feelings. I would hate to be her friend and I feel very bad for Simon. He deserves a better friend. And now, I want to talk about the romance in this book. I didn't like it at all. I was so excited for this book because we were getting bi representation with a female female relationship in a popular YA book, but there was no chemistry. I had no idea where this even came from. It felt so forced. And let's refer back to the dedication for all the people who knew something was up even when I didn't. Yeah. Who who saw that coming except for the adaptation of Simon? Love Simon? There was chemistry. I don't want to spoil anything. I'm sorry if I have released minor spoilers upon all of you, but I would much rather have seen Leah with a new person, not with somebody that we'd have to retcon. It would have been so much better if there was a new girl at school and then yeah, I'd be on board with that. But that didn't happen. And also, Leah is an awful person, especially when it comes to other people questioning their sexuality. And it's never addressed later in the book. People just forgive her. Why? I don't know. Also, moving on from that, just so that I can calm down a little bit. But a little nitpick, it bothers me, I've realized, when contemporary writers use references to pop culture, especially Harry Potter, to win points with their readers. It seems lazy and Becky Albertalli does it all the time. I only realized with this book, but now looking back, 
I have definitely seen it in all of the books I've read from her. Leah even calls herself the resident fat Slytherin Rory Gilmore, which, I mean, it's fine if there's only one reference to it, but it's throughout the entire book. She has people debating Hogwarts houses and talking about Drury fanfic. There are a lot of Hamilton references. It really takes me out of the book. It seems, like I said before, lazy, and it seems like Becky Albertalli doesn't know how kids talk these days or something like that, and so she's filling in the gaps with references. I just like this so much that it's making me rethink the ratings I gave her previous books, and I generally like them when I read them. So I... I just don't know if I'm going to read any more Becky Albertalli in the future. I'll link my Goodreads down below. I have a whole review of this book that has a few more spoilers if you want to know what I'm really talking about, but I was very disappointed. I went into this with very high expectations and I really hope that we get better female-female relationships in the future in YA and just all books because there is definitely a lack of them and I'm sad. I'm sorry for ranting for so long. I had to let it out. It's been sitting with me for months because I didn't do a wrap-up. Moving on from my rants, the next book I read and really enjoyed was Born a Crime by Trevor Noah, his memoir. I listened to the audiobook and it was such a great experience. I really recommend it if you can find the audiobook. Not only does he have a very nice voice, but he speaks so many different languages indigenous to South Africa, where he is from and where this memoir takes place. I hadn't heard practically any of these languages before listening to the audiobook, but he oh, it's so beautiful and he switches between them so effortlessly. This book chronicles his life growing up in South Africa during and after apartheid, which was a 50-year period of racial segregation. Trevor Noah is the son of a black woman and a white man, which was illegal back then. It was very interesting because I had heard of apartheid in history class, but we only talked about it for maybe one or two days during this class, which, I mean, was it a good history class? Probably not. This was an inside look at this oppressive system. It was so interesting. There were so many different factors to apartheid I never even knew of. So I learned a lot about apartheid, but that was not the aim of this book. It's not a history book. I really enjoyed hearing his own stories. He is obviously very funny. He is a comedian. And his mom was so strong. Just seeing how he went from living in poverty in South Africa to being the host of The Daily Show. It's astounding. He was able to balance the seriousness of the situation of being born a crime with his own humor. And I don't have cable, so I've never really seen The Daily Show with him as a host. I wasn't sure if I was going to enjoy his humor, but I very much do. He can really write a story. I was engaged the whole time. I listened to this in only a couple of hours, less than a day, when I was supposed to be studying for my exams. I was listening to this instead. I gave this a 4.5 out of 5 stars because although it was incredibly addictive and I had such a fun time listening to it, it is written non-chronologically, so he skips around from his childhood to when he's older, back to his childhood before the other childhood story. And so I couldn't really keep the timeline straight. He also tended to go on pretty long tangents, but it was enjoyable nonetheless. And upon further reflection, I might bump it up to five stars, but right now, it's at 4.5. Another book that I highly recommend the audiobook of is Sadie by Courtney Summers, which I gave five out of five stars. I will say that this book tackles some very dark topics such as drug abuse, sexual abuse, pedophilia, murder, a lot of tough subjects. So if you aren't up for that, Steer clear of this book. This reads almost like a puzzle with half of it being told from the perspective of Sadie, who basically raised herself and her younger sister after their mother left, and one day her younger sister is found murdered. The other perspective is that of a podcast host who is doing a podcast on her sister's murder in their small town, and also on Sadie's own disappearance after Sadie leaves to avenge her sister's murder. So the podcast chapters are a few steps behind Sadie's chapters chronologically. It makes more sense when you're actually reading it. It's not that confusing, I promise. The reason why I recommend the audiobook is because 
it's not just an audiobook. It is an experience. There is a whole cast of actors, a different actor for each character, and there are sound effects, ambient noises. It sounds like a podcast mixed with an audiobook. Like I said before, Sadie is a very dark book. There are zero moments of levity, which got to be a little much sometimes, I'll be honest, but the dark topics such as pedophilia and sexual abuse and murder are handled so carefully and respectfully. None of the abuse and pedophilia were sensationalized and a lot of it was actually not on the page. Courtney Summers focuses more on the victims of the abuse rather than the abuse itself and I very much appreciated that. That's why I was able to make it through the book because I wasn't sure at the beginning when we learned of the things that were happening wasn't sure I was going to make it. I had to go watch The Good Place so that I didn't get too overwhelmed. Then I read my shortest book of the year, which was We Should All Be Feminist by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I gave it four out of five stars, and as you can see, it really is tiny. Without the acknowledgements, it's only 48 pages. One of my goals in 2018 was to read more nonfiction. Percentage-wise, I think I did, but I mean, number of books that I actually read, not that hot. But because of the goal. That's why I picked this up. I had heard about this essay and the TED Talk for years, but for some reason I never got around to reading it, although it's very short. So I'm happy that I read it. It wasn't mind-blowing. I think it would have been even more meaningful if I read it when I was first discovering and getting into the feminist movement, but a lot of it wasn't new to me. The part that I really enjoyed though, the part that just bumped it up to a four star is that she was talking about her experience as a Nigerian woman and how the feminism movement differs or the idea of feminism differs from Nigeria and the United States. She's so intelligent and she's able to condense such broad topics into such a short amount of pages without losing any of the impact. So I'm happy I read it, I'm happy I watched the TED talk, and I will definitely be picking up her latest or one of the latest essays. It's on my bookshelf right now. Hopefully I will get around to it too. The next book I read was The Forest Queen by Betsy Cornwell. I read this for a book club and I liked it the least out of all of us. I gave it two out of five stars. This is supposed to be a gender-bent Robin Hood retelling, which sounds like it should be right up my alley, but beyond some of the names of the characters and the places being the same, this did not feel like it was based on that at all. There were only a few instances of actual thieving, and most of that was for personal gain rather than giving to the poor, which is kind of Robin Hood's whole thing. I was expecting epic heists, but most of the actual thieving was summed up by characters after the thieving occurred. We stole from this carriage. That's it. <laughs> Instead of showing us them stealing from a carriage. What? Instead, this was mostly a survival story taking place in a very small secluded area of a forest. They so rarely left that area that I was starting to feel claustrophobic. Also, the writing style itself felt like it was catering to younger teenagers edging on middle grade, but there were some graphic depictions of killing and eating animals, killing and skinning and eating them. It felt way out of place. It also seemed like Betsy Cornwell wanted to tackle some darker topics such as sexual abuse and suicide, but they were not handled well at all, especially the attempted suicide. I felt like it was potentially very harmful and the characters, all of them save for one, felt one-dimensional. There were also so many characters, so many people living in this small part of the forest, I couldn't keep their names straight. There was only one supporting character that I felt was kind of fleshed out, and that was the only character I cared about. Their personality traits, especially the main character, were told to us rather than shown to us. So we were told that the main character was brave and this and that, but <laughs> everything happened to her. She didn't really do anything. She was just there. I was just there. We were all just there, not thieving, not doing heists, 
like I wanted. As you can tell, I have a lot of nitpicks. I listed them all out in a Goodreads review. So again, my Goodreads is down below if you wanna know more of my thoughts. I have heard from a few people that they really enjoyed this. So maybe you'll enjoy it. Hopefully I'm not deterring people who want to read this from reading it. On a lighter note, I read The Prince and the Dressmaker by Jen Wang, a deliciously cute and colorful and lovely graphic novel, which I gave five out of five stars. This is a graphic novel which takes place in 19th century France and follows a prince, Prince Sebastian, who likes to put on dresses and turn into his alter ego. Lady Cristalia at night likes to go to the hottest spots in Paris. He enlists the help of a dressmaker named Francis who wants to become big one day, wants to become a designer of her own, but she has to keep Prince Sebastian's secret. It was endlessly cute. I loved Francis and Sebastian's relationship. They were so supportive. They helped each other become the best version of themselves they could become. Gender identity was also discussed very respectfully. I also loved the art style. It is so cute and colorful and bubbly, cartoonish. It was such a pleasure for my eyes. And the clothes were gorgeous. It was atmospheric and pleasant. I was happy to be here. One thing that bothered me is that a character was forced to come out during a public event, but it was resolved pretty quickly and everything seemed to have a happy ending, so that didn't hinder the book for me and I don't think that it was harmful. Overall, it's one of my favorite graphic novels of all time. I love it. I read The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society by Marianne Schaefer and Annie Barrows right after I watched the Netflix adaptation, which I loved. I didn't actually know it was based on a book until after I watched the adaptation. I rated this four out of five stars. This takes place in Britain and the tiny island of Guernsey in the English Channel during the recovery from World War II. Our protagonist, Juliet, is a writer in London and she soon learns that there is a book club in Guernsey that helped them get through World War II when they were occupied by the Germans. She gets in touch with one of the people in the book club and she travels to Guernsey to write a book about them. We learn all about how they survived through the war and the relationships that they formed with one another. Uh, and there's a romance! It's all about the resilience of people and how kindness and connection can get us through the hardest times and there's nothing better to connect over than books. It's a love letter to books and I love reading books about books. I love watching movies about movies and reading books about books and in the case of Evelyn Hugo, reading books about movies. <laughs> I think it's so interesting. I learned so much about Guernsey. Honestly, I thought it was a fictional place until I looked it up. I had never heard of this island before, but you could tell that the authors did their research. I felt like I was there to this place I never knew existed. I will say that I kind of preferred the adaptation over the book because this was written entirely in letters to and from Juliet. I had watched the adaptation beforehand. I already connected to all of the different characters, but I think if I just read the book, I wouldn't have been able to connect with the people and events as much as I did. It was an interesting stylistic choice, but not sure it completely worked. Maybe if it was half in letters, half in prose. The movie also has Lily James as Juliet and what's his face? The brother from Haunting of Hill House and a bunch of people from Downton Abbey. So I was living. So watching the movie before I read the book didn't hinder my enjoyment at all. In fact, I think it heightened it. it provided me that connection and that automatic love for things that happen but the book did fill in some of the details and some of the historical facts that were missing. Either way you read it, it'll work. I'm happy I read it, but I would be more likely to rewatch the movie than reread the book. Next, I read The Diviners by Libba Bray, which I have had on my shelf for years in one form or another. I actually had a different copy of this a couple of years ago, but then I unhauled it. <laughs> But then a few of my friends started reading it, so I picked up a copy again, and then I finally read it, and now I can't imagine ever unhauling it. It was such an interesting story. It's set in the 1920s in New York City. There are kind of like superpowers, magical powers, paranormal ghosts and demons, and what? 
a lot of things are happening in this book. I already ordered the next two books in the series because I only hear it gets better from here. Like I said, this takes place in the 1920s in New York City and it follows several teenagers from different backgrounds. Our main character is Evie who she's kind of annoying. She is a modern flapper girl and she talks about herself a lot, but she kind of grew on me. I didn't want to like her, but it happened. These teenagers all have powers. They are diviners and Evie's power is to read the past from people and objects that she touches. Murders start happening all over the city and it all ties back to the occult. And as it happens, Evie's uncle runs the museum of the occult. Evie and her gang try to find the murderer and bring him down and it all gets pretty darn spooky. I, let's just say that I'll never think of the word naughty the same ever again. I read it before bed. Sometimes I regretted that. I thoroughly enjoyed this book. The only reason why I docked it down from a five star to a four star is that it was just unnecessarily long. It could have been 100 pages shorter. It was a little slow at times and there was a lot a lot of 20s lingo just thrown in. I really hope that people back in the 20s did not speak like that because that would positively not be the cat's pajamas, man. <laughs> Who talks like that? The next book I wanna talk about, I actually did read for school, so I lied earlier, sorry about that. But it is The Best We Could Do by T. Bui. I think that's how you pronounce her name. But this is a graphic memoir and I enjoyed it so much that I wanna talk about it today because I recommend it. I don't have the dust jacket, so I'm sorry about that. I got this book used. It's not very exciting to look at, but I promise, inside. It's pretty interesting to look at. I didn't love the art style at first, but after analyzing it and talking about it in class and talking about the colors used, I have a newfound respect for it. This is a graphic memoir which chronicles her and her family's life growing up and living in Vietnam, fleeing because of the Vietnam War, and then starting a new life in the United States. This covers decades of her family's life. We see how her parents grew up very, very differently from one another and how they struggled throughout the years, especially when it came to the Vietnam War. She examines why there is a sense of separation between her and her parents. It also covers the strain on individuals and a family when they are forced to flee everything that they know and love because of factors outside of their control like war and then are having to go to a foreign land and start a life from scratch without any support system. This was not just good for a school book, this was good for a book. This is staying on my bookshelf. The only required reading I think on my bookshelf that is staying there forever. The next book I read was After I Do by Taylor Jenkins Reid. After I read Evelyn Hugo, I learned that she had written several books beforehand, this being one of them. And now it is my mission to read all of them. I still haven't, but I'm making my way through slowly. I asked a few of my friends what their second favorite Taylor Jenkins Reid book was because obviously Evelyn Hugo was number one and all of them, almost all of them, said this one. So I ended up reading it and I gave it four out of five stars. I think I would have enjoyed it even more if I hadn't read Evelyn Hugo beforehand because I was comparing them the whole time thinking how much I wanted to read Evelyn Hugo again, which wasn't fair to the book. This book follows a married couple, Lauren and Ryan, who have been married for six years and together for 11. As the back says, this is a love story about what happens when the love fades. So they still love each other, they still have a respect for one another, but they're not in love. When they start to question whether or not they should even stay together, they decide to do something pretty radical and not have any contact with one another for an entire year. The year is designed to help them realize what they truly want in the relationship and in life in general. I enjoyed seeing Lauren getting to know herself again, especially since her and Ryan had been together since college, so she didn't really know adult Lauren. I especially love this one quote which said, isn't it nice once you've outgrown the idea of what life should be and just enjoy what it is? Oh, I haven't been in a long-term relationship, but that right there, that one quote spoke to me on a spiritual level. Usually books are about successful relationships and the idealized version of things. This was not the case. Things had failed and she was trying to recover from that. Although I do love my idealistic <laughs> books, I like seeing something more real, even though it is technically fiction. However, my actual favorite part of the book was the first 
50 pages when we were getting flashbacks on how Lauren and Ryan met, when they started dating, when they started falling in love, when they got married, to the present day when they are breaking up. I loved reading the buildup and then the breakdown of relationship. I gave it four out of five stars overall. I still think the beginning was the best, but it was pretty satisfying the entire way through. Because it was October by this point, I had to read some spooky books. So I decided to read a book that I've been meaning to read for ages, especially because I love the movie adaptation of it. And it is Coraline by Neil Gaiman. I love the claymation movie. It is so creepy. I had full on nightmares because of it as a kid. I love the style of it. I love the soundtrack. A plus. But because I love that so much, I went into this with too high of expectations, especially for a 190 page children's book. They added several things to the movie. They added characters, they added songs and dances that didn't happen in here. This book is about a lonely girl named Coraline who moves with her family into a new flat in England. In their flat, they have a door to nowhere. It just opens up onto a brick wall, but then one day Coraline opens it and it is a door to an alternate dimension kind of, a world that strangely mirrors her own, except her mother and father in that world have strange black button eyes and are creepily obsessed with her. They want her to stay in their world forever. Although I was kind of underwhelmed by this story, it does have one of my new favorite book quotes ever. When you're scared but you still do it anyway, that's brave. <sighs> I think it's especially inspiring because it's a children's book, so it's telling you to face your fears. <laughs> I need that sometimes. Coraline didn't give me the creeps except for the illustrations. They were sufficiently creepy. My, my, my. Some of the later ones too. Whew. I'm pretty sure that this would have been one of my favorite books if I read it as a kid, but as an adult who has seen the movie several times, I gave it three out of five stars. I'm still going to keep this on my shelf though. If you're a kid or you like a kid and want them to read a book, lead them to this, but it is kind of spooky, so maybe keep an eye on them. But I wanted to be majorly spooked, so I picked up a graphic novel with some of the creepiest, sometimes grossest, <laughs> illustrations I've ever seen with my two eyes. It is Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, book one by Roberto Aguirre Sacasa and Robert Hack. I feel like this book is cursed. <laughs> like, I don't like holding it. This is a very dark, satanic reimagining of the Sabrina the Teenage Witch we know and love from the Archie comics, from the 90s live action TV show, and if you're me, from the children's cartoon. This is not nice, nor fluffy. It's spiky and mean. <laughs> and I'm scared. <laughs> Netflix released a TV show based on this graphic novel back in October, and I read this in preparation for watching that show, but after reading this, I have not seen it yet. It's no longer October. I don't have the nerve to watch it. I went to knowing that this was dark and creepy, but I wasn't prepared for how dark and creepy. Usually people tell me things are scary, and yeah, I'm a little spooked, but I'm not scared. But I was scared. <laughs> I read this before bed one night, and... I mean, I had a tree that was scratching on my window and it was not a pleasant night's sleep. I gave this four out of five stars when I read it. I thought it was a very interesting twist on a story that I know and love, but sometimes I did think that it was a little bit unnecessary with how they took the story. And the storyline was a little bit confusing at times. There was a lot of lore thrown at us and I'm not familiar with satanic rituals. I thought it was very atmospheric though. The art style, I'm not personally a fan of it, but I thought it definitely fit the mood. What really bumped up the creepy factor, just the fact that I don't find this pleasant to look at. <laughs> so I was not having a great time. I was having an entertaining time. As of right now, I definitely have zero desire to continue the series, and I honestly have zero desire to watch the TV show. Maybe in October when I'm feeling spooky again. So after reading that, I needed a palette cleanser of sorts, so I picked up Maybe in Another Life by Taylor Jenkins Reid, a good old contemporary book to help me sleep at night. This has a similar storyline to the Gwyneth Paltrow movie Sliding Doors, where one small decision from the main character leads to two completely different storylines. I gave this three out of five stars. The concept of the story was pretty interesting, as well as the first couple of chapters, 
But after that, it became pretty monotonous. The storylines weren't different enough, in my opinion. Sometimes even the same sentences were copied and pasted. Maybe they were changed a little bit between the two storylines, but they were mirroring each other kind of, and I wanted something wildly different. I wanted one of them to become like an astronaut or something and then go to space and save the world. I don't know. I wanted some variety. And honestly, I much preferred one of the storylines over the other. So I was at one point finding myself just getting through those storylines to get to the fun ones, the ones that I cared about. Small nitpick, I know I keep nitpicking these books, but there was also a weird obsession with cinnamon rolls in this book. It was kind of cute at first, but then it got annoying pretty quickly. That read like it was part of a YA book. It read like it might have been part of To All the Boys I Loved Before, but this is, a, this is an adult woman and she's obsessed with cinnamon rolls and she just eats cinnamon rolls. How is she a functioning adult? Out of the three Taylor Jenkins Reid books that I've read so far, this is my least favorite, but I'm still going to read all of the rest of her books. Okay, now time for a book I adored, Radio Silence by Alice Oseman, which I gave five out of five stars. It's also very shiny. This covered so many topics that I was struggling with at the time of reading it, including mental illness at university, struggling with creating something, no matter how much you enjoy it and love it while you're dealing with mental illness, and academic pressure, especially academic pressure that you place on yourself. So it really spoke to me. This book is one of only a few that I've read that actually accurately depicts senior year of high school when you're applying for university and studying for exams and figuring out what you want to do with life. Even though this is set in the UK and it's not called senior year over there. Also, the whole testing system is different over there and the university application and all of that is different. I felt understood. I felt like I could so relate to Frances, our main character, and her just inner turmoil while all of this is happening. Like I've said multiple times in this video, I graduated from university at the end of 2018, but this still brought me back to when I was applying to university and doing so many extracurriculars and panicking and not knowing what I was doing at all. I mean, I'm still kind of feeling that. I still very much related to this book. It brought me back, but I also felt like it represented who I was currently. Part of this does actually follow a character in their first year of university, and when reading that, it hit me. I realized that we don't have many books following characters in university. I know New Adult was supposed to bridge the gap between mid-teens YA and 30-something adult books, but let's be honest, most of New Adult focuses on relationships and sex, and most of the time, the characters have just graduated from university. They don't actually go. They're 23, fresh from university. But hello, people go to college as well. So I formally asked the book gods to give us more university-centered books. Anyway, back to radio silence. This follows Frances, who is in her final year of, in America, we call it high school, but she has been at the top of her class for years. She is head girl. She is very focused on academics because she has her sights set on going to Cambridge. She devotes her limited spare time to creating fan art for her favorite podcast, Universe City, not university. One day, the creator of the podcast reaches out to her and asks if she will be the official artist of the podcast, and she obviously accepts. The two of them form a beautiful friendship. They help each other through some pretty rough times and it's just a friendship with such mutual support and platonic affection. It's the sweetest. Also, both of them, as well as several supporting characters, are part of the LGBTQ plus community, which I very much appreciated. I needed to listen to the audiobook of it because there's a podcast in it, so I'm very curious to see how they do the podcast. I hope it's good. It deserves to be good. I then read another five-star book, An Absolutely Remarkable Thing by Hank Green, which I was honestly not expecting to love. I went in with very low expectations because he's a YouTuber and I've been burned by YouTuber books before, but 
Wow! I had no idea what this book was about going in. I hadn't seen any of the Vlogbrothers videos on it. I hadn't even read the back cover. I just knew that he wrote a book and that one of my friends enjoyed it. I think I need to start or stop doing that for future books. I just need to go into books not knowing anything. I need to stop researching the heck out of books before I even pick them up. But in case you do want to know what this book is about, it is a first contact sci-fi novel set in present day America, social media stardom, and all. Our main character is named April May. She is 23 years old, a struggling graphic designer living in New York City, and on her way back from work one day, she stumbles upon an impressive 10 foot tall transformer looking statue. It's on the sidewalk, but because it's like 2 a.m., no one around has seen it. So she asks one of her best friends named Andy. April and Andy? Like from Parks and Recreation? That's all I could think the whole time while reading this. But anyway, she calls him up. He is a YouTuber. They post a YouTube video of April with the 10 foot tall transformer looking thing, which she calls Carl. But it turns out that these Carls have popped up all over the world at precisely the same time. No one knows how they got there. It's very suspicious. April is the first person to have ever interacted with the Carls and posted about it on social media. So she kind of becomes the unofficial ambassador to the Carls. Everybody looks to her for new information and things get out of control. She becomes an internet superstar, a YouTuber supreme. Both her and the Carls are thrust into the spotlight and she becomes more famous and powerful than she could have ever imagined which isn't always a good thing. I don't usually pick up sci-fi because space terrifies me and I don't want to read about it, but this was such an accessible sci-fi story. It reads almost like a contemporary following April and her rise to fame with a few extraterrestrial elements just thrown in. Instead of focusing on the Carls, it focuses more on how humanity reacts to outsiders and the social and political changes and chaos this type of scenario would cause. It felt like this was actually what would happen. My mind was blown. <laughs> Do I like sci-fi now? Just not space sci-fi? I think I do. April also becomes famous through YouTube and uses Twitter to build her brand. And I have read several books about social media stardom and all of that. Most of them are very inaccurate. I'm not a social media star or anything like that, but I know how YouTube works and most of the time writers do not know how it works. Hank Green is a social media star. He knows how it works. I was very thankful for the accuracy of that. Also, April May is such a delightfully awful main character. I loved her and I love to hate her. She, like Evelyn Hugo, does many morally questionable things. But again, like Evelyn Hugo, April May narrates this from the future, looking back at her past. She knows how crappy she was. She knows that many of the decisions she made were not the best, but she is still secure in herself. She knows that she did what she thought was right in the moment. I loved seeing April devolve from an unknown graphic designer who didn't even want to be on social media to somebody who is obsessed with how other people see her and fame and fortune and power. She's smart, ambitious, and awful. But she's not awful for the sake of being awful. She's trying to do a good thing, just not in the best way. Like I mentioned quite a while back, I have three favorite characters of the year. Evelyn Hugo, obviously, then April May, and then Eleanor Oliphant. I think they are very memorable characters. They're all complex. One minor criticism I have for this otherwise fantastic book was that the main character was a bisexual woman written by a man, and sometimes you could tell. Some things that she did and said didn't feel natural, but I did know that he was a man going into this book, so I might have been just more aware of everything that she did. But overall, I really enjoyed this book. I think about this book a lot. Way more than I think about almost any other book that I read this year, and I really want to reread it, especially because there is going to be a sequel. I didn't know that going in that this was going to be a series, but... I'm excited. I then reread Lady Midnight and Lord of Shadows by Cassandra Clare, the first two books in the Dark Artifices trilogy. I reread these in anticipation of going to the Queen of Air and Darkness book signing in December, where I got the book. It's right over there on my shelves. But guess who still hasn't read it? Wow. My heart was 
was not prepared after rereading Lord of Shadows. I knew where Queen of Air and Darkness was going to start and I didn't want to be there <laughs> right now. <laughs> but upon rereading these, I realized that I don't love them as much as I did the first time. It could be partially because I've read these before. I've read this one now three times, so I know how it's all going to end up. But actually often I prefer rereading a book because I am more aware of how the plot is going to progress so I'm able to see all of the easter eggs and I'm able to revisit some of my favorite characters like Christina and Mark and Ty. Not Julian. <laughs> I do not like him, Sam I am. I still really enjoy Lady Midnight. I still gave it five out of five stars. One, because of the nostalgia, but two, because I still think it really holds up even upon the third read of it. It is not a typical Shadowhunters book. It is more a mystery than a, there's a bad guy. Let's go fight him. We have to put together clues and there are red herrings and I love mystery and I love shadow hunters, so put it together and I'm a happy camper. But then I gave this one a four out of five stars. That doesn't sound that low, but for a Cassandra Clare book, that's pretty darn low for me. I've given every other Cassandra Clare book except for her short stories five out of five stars. I felt wrong doing that with this book, especially because the first time I read it this year, I gave it five out of five stars. Cassandra Clare has such a place in my heart. She helped me get through some pretty tough times with her books and she led me to some of my greatest friends now because we all read her books and talked about them together. A lot of reading her books is just being in a happy place. Honestly, I have trouble rating her books objectively. That's why all of them are five out of five stars, except this one now. There are just too many memories and emotions attached to her books even before I even start reading them. But this series, The Dark Artifices, is my least favorite of the bunch. It was strong going in because of Lady Midnight, but honestly the whole thing kind of feels like filler content because we know that there is going to be a series following Ty and Kit when they're a little bit older. It feels like we're just setting up where their story is going to begin. This is just to bridge the gap between the Mortal Instruments and their series. That's not to say that it's bad. It still has some of my favorite moments. Basically, all the moments that Christina is there, I'm there. I'm there for it. Also, Emma and Julian are my least favorite protagonists that we've had so far, especially Julian. He is an interesting main character because I hate him, but I don't like reading from his perspective and I'm not rooting for him. I don't care about the romance at all. I am much more invested in Christina's love life. Emma does have her moments sometimes, but I feel like mostly she's just a carbon copy of Jace, but with boobs. It's been done before. We've had the cocky main character who is very strong, a strong shadow hunter. I'm sick of them. I think it comes down to the fact that I'm not as emotionally invested in this series as I was with the previous two series. It's the third series. She's written a lot of books so far, so I feel like they should just be getting better and better. I only care about Christina. I'm gonna keep on mentioning Christina because all the supporting characters, pretty solid. The main characters, they can just leave, I'd be fine with that. So like I said, it kind of feels like filler. It doesn't feel like it'll be a very complete story in and of itself, but it'll be a good lead up to hopefully a better series with Kit and Ty. Part of the reason why I've been putting off reading Queen of Air and Darkness for so long is because my reread of Lord of Shadows didn't go as well as I was hoping for, and now I'm quite apprehensive going into that book. Honestly, I haven't heard that many good things about the finale to the trilogy. Finally, the last book I read in 2018 was The Afterlife of Holly Chase by Cynthia Hand. It was December, so I had a craving for a holiday book, and this is inspired by one of my favorite classics and a story dear to my heart, A Christmas Carol. This book got so much hype this holiday season. Everybody I knew was reading it or had already read it and loved it. So obviously I had no choice in the matter. I had to read it as well. What were we talking about before? Expectations. All of the hype and my nostalgia, my love for A Christmas Carol. I was expecting something mind blowing, but my mind was not blown. I gave it three out of five stars. It was okay. Very quick read. I read it in only a couple of hours because I could not put it down. I thought the concept was pretty cool. There is a whole Project Scrooge, a whole company 
dedicated to recreating a Christmas Carol, picking out a real life Scrooge and haunting him or her or them, showing their past, present, and future, where they went wrong, where they can help humanity. The main character, Holly, was a Scrooge one year. She was not a good person at all, and she ended up dying a few days later. She comes back as the ghost of Christmas past and has to work with other Scrooges. The concept, though, I was on board for, but the execution, it could have been so much better. Like I said, I was really into this book when I was reading it. I was actually reading it at the same time as one of my best friends, Hannah, from A Clockwork Reader, and while we were reading it, we were exchanging our own theories. I had this whole theory for how everything was going to go down. There were twists and turns. It was very exciting in my head. Then I read the actual ending and it was pretty straightforward and rushed and not satisfying, at least to me, because I had this whole theory planned out. Also, the butterfly effect? Have they heard of it? The romance in this book, I don't know if anybody found it cute because it was not cute at all, for me at least. There was a questionable age gap. Stalking? So because of all of the hype, all of my expectations, and my crazy theory that I developed, it kind of ruined the book for me and I gave it three out of five stars. And after 12 years in Azkaban, we have finally made it to the end of this video. We have talked about every single book that I read in 2018. We're lucky that I didn't read more books than that because this would have been even longer of a video. If you made it this far, I am both impressed and also very thankful or you just had this video on in the background and forgot that you were even watching it, but that's okay too. Thanks for sticking around. I love you all so much. Please let me know down below in the comments how many books you read in 2018, your reading stats, your least favorite book, your favorite book, anything. I love reading your comments. They make my day so much. So thank you for watching and I will talk to you all soon in my next video. Bye.